2018, usually says Greg Goodland, Rio Grande National Forest. So that's it. And again, Hannah, thank you. Let's talk about one of my most favorite subjects in the entire National Forest thing we do, wildflowers. Yeah, so let's see, pulling up that. Can everyone see that? We are seeing your presentation. Perfect. Okay. So I'll be talking about some of the wildflowers of the Rio Grande. So sort of to preface it, I am in no means an expert on wildflowers. Um, I'm reasonably new to the area, but I do enjoy Rocky Mountain wildflowers and getting out hiking, seeing what I can see and trying to identify a couple new ones on every trip I do. Um, so I've picked up some over the last couple of years, um, but can't, can't always get it all the way to the exact species, um, we'll be able to get part way there. So I'm um, gonna just kind of go over a little bit of the basic plant anatomy um, that helps a lot with identifying. And then we'll go some, through some of my favorite and some of the more common wildflowers um, by location. So we'll look at kind of the lower elevations, mountains, woodlands, um, then some of the wetter areas and the alpine wildflowers. So of course there's a lot of overlap between um, the different areas you can find wildflowers, but in general, it's an easier way um, to split them up because it's what you might see in each area. And then we'll talk a little bit about the importance of wildflowers, especially the alpine. And then I have some resources for you all to use um, that I like to use that help with identification and just learning more about uh, the flowers and things around. So kind of got our basic plant parts. Um, so of course we have our petals. And then, um, let's see, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse in there, but we have, um, so the stamen is made up of the anther. So that's a little, that normally like yellow or orange thing that sits on top of um, a little post, which is the filament. And then in the middle um, is the stigma um, and style, and which goes down to the ovary where the seed is made. So that's part of the pistil. So a lot of times in identifying flowers, you'll look at how many stigma or how many, or sorry, how many pistils or stamens there are. Um, a lot of flowers have um, many petals and some have um, actually these sepals that are not quite a petal or a leaf, but they're a sepal and they'll be colored and make it look like it's part of the flower and the petal as well. And then of course we have the stalk and beyond for the rest of the plant. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit. So the big ones are the pistils and the stamens. Um, and so the stamens are the one with little fuzzy things on top, little orange ones and the pistil is generally um, just more straight up in the middle of the plant. And then we have um, some leaves. So looking at leaves can help identify the plant as well. So um, opposite and alternate are pretty self-explanatory. Opposite leaves go opposite each other, alternate switch um, on the side. World will be round the stem in a circle. And then palmate is kind of like a hand. Um, it sometimes has different lobes on it. And then we'll have our simple and compound leaves. So those are kind of the overarching, whether there's lots of little leaflets on a leaf, so almost like fern-like would be compound and then simple would just be one single leaf. And then I've included um, that little flower there. I can't remember what that one is. I've had to look it up a couple of times today, um, but that's got basil leaves. So that's got the leaves around the bottom. Um, and then of course we can look at what the leaf um, margins look like, whether they have hair, hairs on them, whether they're serrated or lobed, um, lots of different things will help us tell that one plant from another um, or just one species from another. So jumping into it, we'll uh, look at some flowers that you might find in the valleys, mountains or wooded areas um, across the Rio Grande. So, by all means, not a comprehensive list, but there are some there that we will cover. So one from lower elevations, um, we'll have our cactuses. So we have our hedgehog or king's cup cactus and prickly pear. Um, there are tons of different prickly pear cactuses and several different hedgehog cactuses. Um, not exactly sure I didn't do a super detailed look at these ones. I just pulled them some older photos, um, but um, the, the hedgehog cactus, the so round, more ball-like ones, um, have mostly flowered by now at the lower elevations. You can still see uh, some of them out there. Um, let me just 
and some of those folks. And then the prickly pear, I was on a run this morning and saw one that was just beginning to bloom. So they're a little later and they are coming on um, starting now. So different flowers bloom at different times. Sometimes they'll bloom all through the summer and other times just for a little bit, spring, summer, or later. So I'll kind of try and talk about when you might expect to see some of these blooming. Um, and of course that varies a lot with elevation. Things will bloom much lower down where it's warmer earlier and where the snow is melted out earlier than up high in the mountains where they bloom later. So we have our evening primrose. This is a beautiful white and delicate flower. They grow really close to the ground. And um, as their name suggests, they bloom in the evening and they'll stay open um, all night long and generally close up during the day. Um, so this will help protect water. But also if you notice they're white, uh, white flowers tend to um, be more night flowers and attract um, nocturnal animals and insects to pollinate them. So um, the hawk moths, which are a big uh, moth, will pollinate the evening primrose and they'll collect nectar from them. So you can't see in this picture, but the flower actually has a really long tube where all the nectar is collected. And most insects can't get in there to get that nectar. Um, but the hawk moth, um, like butterflies, has a long proboscis or a um, tongue. And so they can reach in there to get some of that nectar. So um, they're important for a lot of our moths and other, um, in some places, bats will pollinate night flowers, um, things like that. And they do dr grow in um, often drier areas. I believe last week I saw some along the side of the road on the way up to Creed. Um, sometimes they'll just like look like little um, like toil flower or paper or something that been tossed aside out of the car um, because they are so delicate and light and white. Um, and a little fun fact about them is that uh, their root used to be used to flavor wine. So our next one is the Scarlet Julia. Um, so this is a bright red one, um, really pretty trumpet shaped flower. It grows in um, generally drier areas, more open. Um, you wouldn't find this as much in the woodlands, but along the side of a trail or a road, uh, you're likely to spot this and it's in the Phlox family. Um, so it's got five petals and um, they um, have those sort of winged, winged petals at the end after the tube. Um, they'll have multiple flowers on a stalk um, with not too many leaves. Their leaves are thinner um, and often lower down, um, but they're a pretty bright sight and easy to spot out as they're one of the, one of the fewer bright red flowers. Um, we have our Western wallflower. So this one is in the mustard family. Uh, mustard plants in the mustard family generally have four leaves and they will also have uh, four tall stamens and two short stamens. Um, so that's what the, the anthers are on. Um, so you can, if you look really closely, if you're into to getting in really deep and nitpicky with the flowers, you can look at um, the number of those. Sometimes there's too many to count, um, but on plants in the mustard family, um, they'll have four petals, which is a big giveaway. Um, to get there. And so this is a globe, sort of a globe of yellow flowers on a long stalk. Um, they do like drier areas across the mountains. Um, and I have seen some of those blooming recently. And we have yarrow, which is very common um, across the whole country. Um, it can be just a weed in your, in your yard. Um, it can be ornamental in a garden. And of course it grows wild around here. So it has very uh, feathery um, fern-like leaves. They're soft and they're um, pretty aromatic if you were to crush them and smell them. And then it's got um, like a flat plate of little flowers. Uh, they can be white, mostly often white, but they will um, be tinged pink every now and again. Um, and you can get a lot of ornamental colors of yarrow as well. Um, they're in the aster family. So we'll talk a little bit about the asters in a bit. Um, and they are, their um, genus name is Achillea, which is named after Achilles. Um, and that is because Achilles used it to treat soldiers wound in the Battle of the Troy, of Troy. And so yarrow is an important medicinal um, plant for a lot of tribes and across the world. Um, it can sort of help stop bleeding, um, compresses, teas, lots of different forms of it were used. Um, so a lot of a lot of the plants we, and flowers we'll see um, do have traditional or medicinal uses or used as a food source. Um, do your research before you go out and start picking, consuming, or using any of these, um, as there are also quite a few that are very poisonous and some that are just deadly. Um, so 
make sure you do that. Where there's quite a lot of great guidebooks out there as well if you're looking to get into um, edible and medicinal. Um, but I'll share some of the uses that they have traditionally been used for. Um, a lot of times they'll be used, they'll be uh, poisonous, but used in a tea or um, lots of different uses in that sense. So this is one of my favorite ones, um, mostly just because of its name. It's a tiny little flower, it's Pussy Toes, and it gets its name because it looks just like a little cat's paw with all their little toe beans. And so they'll have clusters of um, just a few small heads, um, little, they'll actually be a lot smaller than a cat's paw, um, but they um, uh, can be rosy or just plain white. They, uh, these flowers grow on a tall um, stalk and are, tall for the tall for the whole plant um, and they'll have more leaves at the bottom and you can see them in a lot of different areas dry areas up high in the mount, um, mountains not quite an alpine flower because they do grow tall um, but they are part of that and so they're a fun little flower that are pretty cute to pick out let's see and we have penstemon which is often a more showy flower um, they're often called beard tongues as well. Um, so they're tubular flower. There are tons of different species. Um, we have more than 36 species in the Four Corners area. And so they can be difficult to tell apart between species. You'll have to look um, really detailed. But the great thing is you can see one and just say that's a penstemon. And you can see another one and that's a penstemon as well. Um, so they're most often purple and purpley blues, um, but there are some red ones as well, um, sometimes pink as well. And yeah, they are a pretty little tube flower. They have um, flowers generally at the top of the stalk, sometimes um, up and down the stalk a little bit. It depends on the species there. Uh, then we have our paintbrush, which is out and about. That was one of the earlier flowers I saw around here. Um, so again, lots and lots of different species of paintbrush and they are really hard to tell apart. You can have an orange and a yellow and a red paintbrush all in the same area and they might be the same exact species, even though they're different colors. So there's lots of different varieties. Um, the red paintbrush is um, really important as food for hummingbirds um, as well as bees. So the way the um, flowers design, most of the red parts are not actually um, petals, they are bracts. Um, so sort of another plant part um, that makes the petal. It does have teeny tiny petals, but they're not really the showy part of it. And so um, red attracts hummingbirds. If you have a red uh, hummingbird feeder or something like that, most insects don't see red as well. Um, so generally, if you had red flowers, they are um, trying to attract hummingbirds to pollinate and um, eat their nectar. And so these um, are designed to have um, hovering the flowers are designed to have hovering um, pollinators visit them because they don't have a place to land. Um, sometimes like the tube flowers, a bee can fly in there and it'll get co covered in pollen on its way in and it can crawl in there or a fly or an ant. Um, whereas these don't have anywhere for an insect or a bird to land. So, um, and they also have um, sort of long tubes that bees, bees and hummingbirds can get into. Um, and then another interesting thing about these, so our plants, live in dry and high and alpine areas where life is pretty tough. And so they've developed all sorts of ways to survive, whether it's growing really little or tall or um, trying to prevent water loss. But the paintbrush is a hemiparasite. So it's a half parasite. Uh, so they can photosynthesize and take in nutrients through their roots, um, but they also parasitize um, other like perennial grasses and other plants around and they will get nutrients from them. So their roots underground will go and um, basically attach to other grass roots and take the nutrients that those roots are taking in uh, to help the paintbrush survive. So this is a beautiful little flower, uh, one I've seen a lot of recently. Um, they like wooded areas, so a lot of um, spruce and fir forests. Um, they're just a little open, a little more moisture, a little more cover there. Um, and sometimes you'll find just one or two plants, but a lot of times you can find almost a carpet of them with their uh, little green leaves and uh, purple flowers. So this is beautiful Jacob's Ladder. Um, when the, so it's in the polymonium family. Um, and so when the leaves are uh, crushed, um, it smells really skunky. Um, it's got a really strong smell. So you might not even um, 
have to go up to the the plant to smell it you if you're just walking through and the person in front of you happens to step on the edge of one of these um, plants or just crush a couple leaves you'll smell it or sometimes just the whole um, whole area will smell like these um, the polymonium um, has another alpine species that we'll look at later and a lot of times you'll smell that up high in the alpine as well um, so it has opposite little leaves. Um, they kind of look fern-like and um, they're in the phlox family as well. So the phlox generally have narrow leaves. Um, these have narrower uh, ones that look a little more fern-like and they have five petals and generally they make uh, sort of a tube. So you can see on the side of those, um, it's got a little bit of a tubular shape coming down the back. Um, much like the red scarlet gelia we saw earlier, that was a very tube-shaped family and it's also, or tube-shaped flower and it's also in the phlox family. Then we have our fireweed. So uh, fireweed is beautiful, it grows all over. Um, as its name suggests, it often grows in places burned by wildfire. So it does great in disturbed areas, whether that's from fire, whether that's from erosion, um, even construction or uh, development, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's a, a taller flower, it's not blooming yet. It tends to bloom mid to um, even later summer. And um, you can see it's got those, uh, when it goes to seed, it's got those fluffy little seeds, almost like a dandelion. So they'll catch in the wind and blow long distances. And this is important as it likes to colonize disturbed areas and often burned areas. And it can't just have a bird carry it from one burned area to another. So having its seeds travel really long distances is important for its survival and dispersal and being able to find the right habitat. Um, so the fireweed has been used as a food source. Um, some indigenous uh, groups would use um, the stem and eat it almost like asparagus or um, peel it when they'd steam it. Um, others um, use the leaves. Um, some folks are still using it today. And it is another important one for pollinators, especially since it flowers a little later in the season. And then we have our shooting star columbine, our columbines and lark spurs. Um, so um, columbine have pretty distinctive leaves. Um, I've seen quite a lot of columbine plants out there. They aren't quite flowering yet, um, but you can tell them apart by their leaves. So they have those um, sort of three lobed, often in groups of three leaves um, with little, little more lobes between them. Um, so they, um, if you can recognize the columbine leaves, you'll be able to pick out the plants often um, before they begin to flower. And we've got uh, two types here. We, of course, have our Colorado columbine, um, the beautiful purpley blue one with a white center um, that is the Colorado state flower. And we see that almost everywhere. So a lot of folks can recognize that one. Um, it tends to grow um, in open meadows or just slightly wetter areas. They don't like the really, really dry um, soils that other uh, plants can survive in. And then we have our shooting star columbine. So it almost looks like a columbine minus its um, pretty sort of skirt-like petals. Um, it's just got the red horns and um, yellow. And um, they are, let's see, um, they get their name. So their name is Aquilegia. And there's kind of two theories of where that, um, that Latin name came from, either eagle, Aquila, um, which would be from um, the sort of spurs off of it that are much like an eagle's talon, or um, because it its name might come from um, two words, aqua and leisure, um, for referring to like nectar at the base of the flower. So the um, nectar in those is stored uh, much deeper. And so that's another way it could have gotten its name. Of course, there are many, many ways folks think um, these plants were named. Um, and then, um, so the shooting star combine, kind of an idea where it lives is often more woodland um, areas, wooded areas. Um, they're pretty small. This one um, that I just took a photo of recently was probably no more than three or four inches tall. And I just spotted it um, the other week when I was out with Greg doing um, at the conservation camp at Beaver Creek. And it was just a little, little tiny flower in the middle of uh, the big woods just growing there um, really low to the ground. And then we have our Larkspur. So it can often be confused with Columbine. It does have that um, spur off the back or sort of talons like the Columbine and then the more showy face petals. Um, but you will see uh, multiple little flowers on one stalk for Larkspur. Um, they aren't generally quite as big as the Colorado Columbine and they'll be a uh, darker blue most usually 
Um, and all those flowers are in the same family, the buttercup family. So they don't look much like a buttercup um, because they've got much more fancy petals, um, but the petals are just slightly more modified um, to have those spurs than the normal um, buttercup flowers that you would see. And we'll see some more buttercups, uh, more plants in the buttercup family that look a little more like buttercups. So then we have our lupins in the pea family. Um, so we have our silvery lupin, which is the purple one. It's blooming now. Um, depends where you are. You can see it. some lower elevations. It it's bloomed a couple of weeks ago and up higher, it's probably just starting. Um, so we have the silvery lupin and then the yellow one is mountain golden banner. Um, so that looks similar. The golden banner looks similar to a lupin. Um, its leaves are a little different. It's got um, I believe it's like three lobe leaves. They're, they're all palmate, so like fingers on a hand with the leaves or like a palm tree leaf. Um, it's got only three lobes instead of many more like the lupin. And it doesn't have quite as long a stem with all the flowers, but it does have a couple. And um, both of them are pea shaped. So if you see like sweet pea flowers, um, they look similar to that. Um, so they have um, little wings and a center and a bottom keel flower or, or petal, sorry. Um, and because they're in the pea family, they're great at fixing nitrogen um, like most members of the pea family. So they are um, helping cycle nutrients through the soil. Um, and then there's quite a lot of other plants that and flowers that you can find um, that are in the pea family. Clover, um, we have some clover that'll grow all the way up to the alpine. Um, vetches look similar to this, only almost a miniature version. Um, and then of course peas. Um, and when they go to seed, their um, seed pods will look very similar to a pea pod with um, many seeds in one line in the pod. So we have Oregon grape here. Um, these have a more distinctive shiny leaf. Um, they are a compound leaf, so many leaves on one leaf stem. And they almost look like holly leaves. They can be a little almost spiky looking. And um, it's an early season flower. So they are, um, the leaves are evergreen. So they'll be green all through the winter, which means as the snow melts, they're able to start photosynthesizing much earlier and therefore can flower a bit earlier. Um, so I, lower down, I think a lot of the Oregon grape has already flowered and I've even seen some um, green little fruits on it um, from after, after flowering, um, but, I'm sure there are some shady areas where it is still blooming. They're um, really fragrant flowers. Um, and they are not um, a true grapes. They're not related um, to grapes that we use for eating or juice or wine. Um, they are just named for that because they look a lot like grapes. Um, they were used in traditional medicine. Um, you can eat them. They don't taste great in my experience. Um, and then again, of course, make sure you know um, what you're looking at there, um, but um, they've been used for traditional medicine as well as Western medicine. Um, so they are in the barberry family. And so they produce a compound, um, a berbenine compound, which um, is derived from this plant and it can be used to um, help stabilize blood sugar. And there've been studies on it that show it can kill amoebas and even giardia. Um, so a lot of that is just studies. Um, look, plants have tons of different compounds and um, things in them that um, we have used today to develop many of our medicines and still are researching to see what um, benefits they could provide us. Um, aspirin is from willows and that's a, a huge one that we use today. So back to our flowers. So we have several here in the aster family. So they all look pretty similar, sunflower, yellow flowers. Um, yellow flowers like this can be incredibly hard to distinguish. Um, the aster family is huge or the, the sunflower family. Um, it's the second largest family of plants um, with many different subfamilies in it. Um, so lots and lots of groups. Um, asters generally look kind of like a sunflower, an aster, a daisy, um, fleabane, lots of different names for it. Um, but if you look really closely, um, it's not actually just one flower. Sunflowers or asters um, have many, many, many tiny little flowers on the head. And so each little flower there will produce a seed like a sunflower. So you get all the seeds on the sunflower head. Each one of those is actually from its own individual flower. 
Um, and then when all those seeds fall off, you'll, the um, plant will have a pitted head. So if you ever look closely after you blow all the seeds off a dandelion, you'll see that there's lots of little pits in it. And on a much bigger scale, a sunflower has all the pits on it where the seeds, um, when you take the seeds off. So that is a one distinguishing characteristic of the aster family. Um, and so these three look pretty similar. You can find them generally in the same area. Um, heartleaf arnica tends to grow in more wooded and shady areas where arrowleaf balsam root and mule's ears will grow more out in the open at the edge of woodlands or um, before, prefer more direct sun. Um, so heartleaf arnica is not quite as showy. It's got smaller flowers. Um, the leaves are heart shape as its name suggests and have um, slightly more jagged edges than the other two. Um, they're just a little more delicate and light, not quite as sort of leathery and tough. Um, part of that's because they grow in the shade and don't need to protect as much from water loss. Um, so there's many different species of Arnica. Um, you might've heard of like Arnica gel or um, you can, it can help sometimes with breathing or arthritis. So Arnica as a species has between 29 and 32 species, depending on how, who you ask, 26 in North America. Um, most are pretty difficult to distinguish, but the heartleaf Arnica is one of the easier ones um, because it is leaf is shaped like a heart where others are not. Um, and then the European species Arnica montana um, has been used to treat lots of different elements and um, they make creams and all kinds of things out of that. Um, and then there was traditional use of this Arnica here. Um, and moving on to our arrowleaf balsam root and mule's ears. These two look almost more similar, um, so, but if you look closely at the leaves, arrowleaf um, balsam root, as its name suggests, has arrowhead shaped leaves, um, whereas the mule's ears are more shaped like a mule's ear, so longer and narrow versus um, wider and a little shorter. So um, the arrowleaf balsam root leaves are about four inches and about six Four inches wide and about six to nine inches long um, and it tends to bloom a little earlier in the spring um, and the mule's ears um, definitely overlap um, in blooming period um, but their leaves are um, more are narrower so about two to four inches in width um, compared to the about four of the early balsam root and they'll grow much longer about 16 inches um, or so, and they tend to grow taller as well, just as a whole plant. So those three are some of our fun yellow flowers you can find out in the meadows. Um, and keep your eye out for those. And let's see, we have more asters. Um, so orange sneeze weed on the left um, has slightly more wiggly petals and um, I am not sure what the purple one is. It's some sort of aster or flea bane. Um, as I said, they're incredibly difficult to tell apart. You gotta look at lots of different things. Um, leaf shape, size, flower height, which can vary a little bit depending on the elevation it's growing at. Um, but I can tell you that it's in the aster family. Um, and then we have prairie smoke. So this is a really fun little flower also um, called Oldsman's Beard. And I believe it has a couple other common names. Um, so it right now is um, blooming in generally more um, meadowy um, sort of brushy areas. Um, not, it's not a woodland plant. Um, and it has these pinky heads um, that look like almost a little ball with little spikes off of them or or petals off of them and the flowers will hang down. And then as the flower um, starts to pass and wilt, it, the head will actually turn upright, which is sort of opposite of most flowers as they begin to wilt and die, the heads of the flowers will often droop. Um, but these ones turn upright. And then um, the styles will elongate. So the style is part of the pistil, um, not the anther with the little pollen thingy on it. And they will um, turn into those long threads um, with sort of fluffy ends um, that give it its name of prairie smoke. They'll be almost gray, sometimes a little pink in there. And um, they are a really nice, um, fun flower that's fun throughout the year. So fun when they bloom, they're a little more um, inconspicuous when they are blooming, um, but they're more showy in their seed form, which is a little different. And they're in the rose family. So they're five petaled and the rose family is also pretty big. It's got um, lots of our fruits um, that we eat in the, are in the rose family, like an apple. So we'll move on to our wetter areas. So plants, of course, need water. 
Um, in the alpine and montane areas, water is often in short supply. Um, so plants have figured out ways to deal with that. Um, but in wet areas and seeps and along creeks are a great spot to begin looking for wildflowers because life is just a little easier. Um, most of the time you don't have quite that demand always looking for water or trying to save water. Um, so as many have adopted to live in arid areas, we have some that like to live with their roots completely soaked in water. If you have any houseplants, you know that's not always a good thing. Um, so they can tolerate much more. This is one of my favorite ones you can find in wetter areas. It's elephant's head. Uh, so it's a pretty pink little one. Flowers all grow up in a stalk and it gets its name from looking just like a little elephant. Head, ears, um, trunk and all. So you've kind of got to get down close and look at the um, this one to see it um, in all its detail. Uh, it's in the broomerite family and its leaves look very fern-like. Um, they're almost a reddish, brownish green color. Um, and it definitely likes the boggier, wetter areas. Um, and its roots um, parasitize other plants to help get nutrients much like the paintbrush did. Then we have our monk's hood, hood and wolf spain. Um, so two different names for the same thing. Um, there are many common names for plants. Often different species have the same common name. Um, I've used common names because I find them a little easier to remember than the binomial or Latin name of two parts that looks hard to read and hard to pronounce. Um, so the monk's hood are the two on the right. They're often confused with larkspur, which is below that we looked at earlier with the columbine. And um, so kind of differences between the two, the monk's hood looks more hooded and less spur-like, um, less almost columbine-y. And they'll grow, um, depends on what kind of larkspur, but oftentimes they'll grow taller than the larkspur around here. Um, and they're a much deeper, darker purple. And they like wet areas, um, often much more wet areas. Um, and so they are a really poisonous plant. Um, you wanna stay away from those when you are collecting. Um, there's various species across the world. Um, their toxins have been used in poison arrows. Um, and for, for hunting, it's wolf spain name. It was used for poisoning wolves. Um, and the larkspur is uh, toxic as well, um, can be really toxic to uh, cattle, um, but not quite as um, toxic as the um, monk's hood. And you can tell the difference between the two because larkspur has a hollow stem as well. Um, not that we wanna be picking the plants to ID them all, um, but I'd say there's lots of different features you can use as well. Um, so that's that one. And then um, marsh marigold, as its name suggests, it does enjoy growing in marshy areas. Um, so the marsh marigold and globe flower are both in the buttercup family and often um, both found growing together. So a lot of times you will see a whole um, meadow or a little wet area of marsh marigold. And if you look closely, some might look a little different. And those are likely to be the globe flower. Um, so the globe flower have um, slightly yellower um, leaves or petals, sorry, and um, more rounded petals. And um, they look like a big buttercup because they are in the buttercup family. Um, and the marsh marigold has um, more, more feathery, um, sort of deeply palmate and deeply cut leaves. Um, so you can kind of see there, um, they're cut and curled, more jagged than the smooth edge, um, almost more waxy looking marsh marigold leaves. So marsh marigold is an early season flower. It is blooming all over the place right now in wet, wetter meadows, um, even up high. And the globe flower is often along with it. So those are two great ones you can often find together. And of course we have our bluebells there in the forget-me-not family. There's quite a lot of different species of bluebells, um, but it's easy enough to identify them as just bluebells. And as you can see from the pictures, they sure do like living near water. Um, they're a big one that you'll find along creeks and they've got a sort of variation of pinks and purples and blues in their flowers, uh, their hanging little, little tubes. We have our wild onions. Um, so let's see the, the middle picture there um, hasn't quite flowered. It's just the, the buds of the onion. Um, and they come from a bulb, just like the onions you buy from the store. And their um, flowers are usually in umbels. So um, um, kind of like an umbrella. Um, it's got all the spikes like the yarrow. It's got almost a flat top with lots of um, branches coming up to make all the different flowers. And 
say um, if you were to pick a leaf and smell it, it would smell like onion, and that'll that'll tell you that it that's what it is. It's in that family. Um, um, they ha also have the hollow stems and leaves, um, like chives or scallions, um, green onions, like that. So then we have our blue flag iris. This grows in water areas. You might have seen that around in the valley. It's blooming all over the um, irrigated fields right now. I think it's just pa just passing. It's reached its peak, um, at least around Del Norte in the irrigated fields, um, but it also grows out in the wild. Um, so I believe this is the Western blue flag iris. You can see a little flyer bee coming in there to pollinate it and visit it. Um, so again, important for the pollinators as all of these flowers are. The colors of them can vary slightly from blues to purples to lighter colors. Um, every now and again, you might see a white one. Um, they're definitely more rare, all the same species um, and they'll grow all over the place down in the valley here in the wetter areas up in some of the high country in the marshes um, and they'll bloom in the late spring to early summer. So right around now. And then moving on, we've got our alpine flowers. Um, so we'll go through a couple of these. Um, if you make it to the alpine, you definitely won't be disappointed by the flowers. I'm sure you'll see many on the way up to that elevation. Uh, life is pretty hard up there, but um, the flowers do grow among the rocks and the grass. So we have um, another polymonium, the sky pilot. So this is um, like the beautiful Jacob's ladder, same, same family, um, same genus. And um, they have, again, those skunky, stinky leaves. Um, they're much smaller. You can see they're um, almost fern-like, but the, so that's the one on the left, um, the purple one. They're um, those uh, like fern-like leaves are much closer to, closely stacked together. Um, and they've got tube flowers. They're in the fox phlox family, and they are much uh, deeper purple and more tubular than the um, beautiful Jacob's ladder. And they've got the bright orange um, anthers in there um, that give it a little more color. And then we have the phlox on the right. So that's a mat, a cushion, a cushion plant um, with five petals as well. Um, I think here we have the creeping phlox. And that is a um, ornamental plant as well. It grows in lots of different color varieties. In the wild, most often you'll see white and occasionally some white pink in there. Um, and it grows very happily between the rocks. And the sky pilot will grow in the grassy meadows, up, up high um, in alpine areas. It's um, a pretty hardy plant. And we've got this really cute little one. Um, it's in the forget-me-not family. It is the alpine forget-me-not. They're bright blue flowers found high on the alpine, really close to the ground. Um, you can spot them from a little further distance because their blue stands out so much. Um, it's very similar looking to the other forget-me-not species in the same family. Um, you might see some of those lower down. They'll just be on a longer stem and stalk. These ones grow in a cushion just like the phlox. And then we have um, this silky facilia, facilia um, and this is a really fun plant. It grows up high in the alpine, um, subalpine and montane as well. It's in the forget-me-not family, um, but it's stamen and anthers stick way out, making it look really, really a, like a fluffy plant. It's a beautiful purpley blue. Um, and um, there's been six new species named since 2007. So um, a lot of these flowers, um, we're still kind of figuring out where they fit in um, classification and how they're all related together, related to each other. Um, and one really interesting fact about this one is that um, assayers were um, able to figure out, it accumulates gold um, in its tissues. So many plants will accumulate uh, valuable minerals or just minerals in general. Um, and then this can be used to ask, or this plant can be used to assay and prospect for gold deposits. So if it has a higher, it'll, um, it can have a higher quality quantity than the ground. You're not going to get rich in, in any way from um, harvesting this. It's in parts per billion, um, but it is a good, can be an indicator. Um, if you test a plant instead of the soil, it'll give you maybe a closer reading of that area. That's just a little interesting fact about them. 
Um, but many of our alpine plants are just tiny. You can see the forget-me-not next to my finger there. My finger kind of looks giant. Um, they are itty-bitty. Um, on the right is the moss campion. So that's another um, cushion plant. Um, they, those flowers are less than half an inch across. Um, they live in the alpine and those buds just emerge straight from the mossy looking mat and uh, bloom right there. So they can put on a pretty, pretty nice show. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, how these alpine flowers survive and then go on to some resources for you. So surviving in the alpine, um, as we've seen, they're tiny. Um, so size um, being just tiny helps them stay out of the wind and under the snow in the winter. Um, so the snow will protect and insulate from both the wind and the cold. And then in the summer, um, closer to the ground is gonna be warmer than above. So if they can be right close to that ground where the sun is heating, stay out of the wind just a tiny bit more, um, they'll basically have the couple hours longer of growing um, when it is more favorable for them. Um, the shape, you've often seen that they're in cushions, um, really low to the ground as well. Um, so those cushions help absorb heat. It can raise the temperature of the plant um, several degrees at least, and also allows the wind to blow over the plant, almost like it would blow over a rock instead of shaking its leaves to and fro and um, just probably blowing them away when it gets really breezy up there. And then their leaves, are either waxy, they can be thick, they can be fuzzy or needle-like. Um, so much like desert plants, um, they have adapted to deal with uh, very little water and so they need to reduce any moisture loss. Um, so um, having waxy leaves, that waxy cuticle will protect them from drying out. Um, just like putting chapstick on your lips. Um, being thick means there's just more volume there to store a little water um, or less surface area to lose water. Um, being fuzzy, all the little fuzz on them will bake, make the teeniest little microclimate where um, they can trap moisture. So when it does escape the leaf, it gets stuck in its own little cloud. And so it'll lose less um, because it is just more humid around it. So it's less drying. And then needle-like, um, like our pine, fir, and spruce trees, um, it helps prevent water loss um, just by shape. And often those needle-like leaves are waxy as well. And then the colors, a lot of times you'll find reds or blues um, or combinations, pinks and purples um, of that. And so some plants will use their color as a survival tool. So they have um, pigments, anthocyanins, um, that are either red or blue and they can convert light into warmth. And so this will help warm the plant tissues because um, if it's really cold up there, um, freezing the plants cannot grow. Um, so like the moss campion, um, that pinky red and the alpine, the blue alpine forget-me-nots, um, they can help convert some of that heat or that light into heat to help them out. And then um, we can talk briefly about sky islands. So I think um, islands in the sky is a great way to picture it. Um, basically isolated mountain peaks that are surrounded by a different lowland. Um, so there's some areas um, south of here in New Mexico and Arizona um, that are much more separated um, by vast areas of lowlands, um, desert, where um, there, it's a very different environment where these teeny little plants or animals can't survive. Um, but on our peaks here, we have smaller version. The islands are a little closer together, um, but it means that dispersal is hard. Those plants can't just move down the mountainside and then back up another mountain to colonize a new spot. They need their seeds moved by an animal or the wind between peaks. Um, and so they can't uh, travel between habitats very easily. So a lot of times um, our plants are, and alpine plants are here from the last ice age where they sort of retreated up the mountains. Um, they've got a really, really tough life up there. Um, it can take 20 to 100 years um, to recover if they've been damaged or stepped on. So that's why staying in, on trails in the alpine is incredibly important. Um, so a lot of our 14ers in Colorado um, have trails up them where many other peaks do not. Um, and while that makes it really nice for us to hike them and find our way, it's often because it's to protect the alpine tundra habitat. So by keeping on the trail um, and following the trails, it protects the, the vast area instead of everyone finding their own way and crushing these little plants. Um, 
not only is, does it take them a long time to grow, but the soil um, is also very precious up there. It can take about a thousand years to develop just one inch of soil. So there's nothing much up there to begin creating it. Um, so those little plants take a long time to cycle through. And they also have a really short growing season. So in Colorado, in the Colorado Alpine, it's often only six to 10 weeks of good growing for them. So that is not long if you think about what you could grow in your garden in that time. It sure isn't much. Um, and then those plants, once they can grow, um, partly because their season is so short, um, it can take seven to 10 years before they even begin to flower and that would be begin to make seeds to reproduce. So they have it pretty tough up there. Um, so we need to help take care of them and protect them. And so we have many species as well, other than flowers that rely on our alpine plants and their little wildflowers. So our pollinators, our bees, our butterflies, our moths, um, little flies, all sorts of those, ptarmigan, um, eat the plants up, plants and berries up high. Um, one of my favorite is our little pica there. You can see he's got some forget-me-nots right in his mouth. They store food all winter long and often will store flowers. Um, they're even clever enough that if a plant is toxic um, when it's living, they know that they can dry it and it'll become less toxic and they can consume it. Um, so they'll make their hay piles under the rocks in the alpine I'm eating many of these little plants. And then we have our bighorn sheep that live and travel up there eating the grasses, flowers, and the forbs as well. And we'll move on quickly to some resources you can use. So there's a couple different apps and a couple websites. And of course, there's always guidebooks. Um, so two of the apps, the first two are iNaturalist and Seek. You might've heard of these before. So iNaturalist uh, does require a login account. You can use it on the app or on a computer. Um, you can record encounters and sightings. You can crowdsource identification. So I could post a picture of something and say, hey, I don't know what this is. It's a flower I saw in the Alpine. And someone can comment on it and help you identify it. You can help identify others' pictures. Um, and it's an amazing citizen science tool. So you can tag exactly where you found that plant or flower or animal um, or whatever you discover. And that data can be used. Um, it's used right here on the forest um, to track bighorn sheep sightings and other plants and amphibians. Um, and it's used by resource managers all over the place and scientists as well. Um, and sort of an app that can be paired with that is Seek. Um, you don't need an account and you can do real-time ID in the field. So you basically, um, it'll turn your camera on and you can hover it over the plant and um, it'll get you as close as it can with um, genus family species or family genus species or beyond. Um, you can also take a picture and upload them later. And um, both these have the option to learn more about those species. They have a database um, where you can learn a little more. And you can also connect Seek to your iNaturalist account. So I kind of did some screenshots here. You can get an idea. Um, it can get all the way to the species. So it told me it was a Western blue flag iris there. Um, or the arrow leaf balsam root. It didn't get quite a good enough look. It let me know that it's in the sunflowers family. So it's in the aster. Asteraceae, it got all the way to the genus, um, but couldn't tell me much beyond that. So then after that, you can either be satisfied with your answer and know that it's some type of sunflower, or you can do your own research. Um, and then, um, so I kind of have the levels there, the, the green dots will show you how far it gets from kingdom, phylum, class, order. And you can do this with any, um, you can do it with animals, you can do it with fungi, lichen, um, and if it didn't find the species, you can always click the tap to load species nearby and find other similar species. And maybe you'll find the one that you actually saw or they're not always right. Um, and then there's this great app. It's the Colorado Wildflowers app. A lot of different states have them um, for their local wildflowers. So you can select um, what type of plant it is, whether it's a shrub, cactus, grass, flower, it's um, color got to count how many petals it has and approximate size and then looking at that leaf arrangement, um, whether it's opposite, um, alternate, basal, or more palmate, and then choosing the habitat it lives in. And then um, it'll pull up a list of plants and you can scroll through the pictures and see what it looks like. And then it's got some more information. So I kind of showed the um, different plants there and I picked one we had looked at earlier. And then there's some guidebooks. Um, so if you're looking to get into more of the nitty gritty, but not on a super scientific, um, in-depth research paper kind of level, Botany in a Day um, is great. I've used that a lot for plant identification. It goes through the families and gives you some sort of key things to look for to figure out 
um, what plant it is. Um, it's got lots of information about those plants. There's many different wildflower of Colorado, of the Rocky Mountains, of the Southwest um, guidebooks you can get. And then there's also um, some more brochure styles. Often they're, um, they're laminated, so you can take them out in the field. It's not carrying around a whole guidebook, um, but it'll get you a lot of the basic flowers and the common ones out there. So that's about what I've, all I've got. I hope you might have learned a couple or inspired you to get out and see what's, what's blooming out on our forest. Um, now things will be blooming, of course, throughout the summer and you'll always be able to see something new when you go out there. Um, and even if you can't ID the flower or don't know what it is or don't remember what it is, it's still beautiful and it's got an important role out there and I'm sure lots of other critters appreciate it too. So thank you all. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or shout them out. It's amazing how fast that can go. I, I just can't imagine. Um, I want to ask myself, Hannah, did you say the lupin are in the pea family? Yep, they are. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, if you imagine they're like seed pods, if you've ever seen them, they're exactly like a pea pod. Got all the little um, seeds in it. You can split them open long ways. Um, when they're ready to spread their seeds, they'll actually, they'll dry out and dry and dry, they'll grow and then dry out. And then they'll pop open and that throws the seeds just a little little ways away. Well, it makes sense, but now you got me thinking about it. What am I missing on all the other ones too, right? <laughs> um, folks, feel free to put a, a questions in the chat or just come on up. We're a small enough group where you can just unmute your microphone and uh, um, come on up and ask any questions real quick. Barbara, is that that's a clapping hand, isn't it? Not a raised hand. I got a small screen here. So I'm saying thank you. <laughs> that's really good. Well, well, thank you for coming on. Um, yeah, so totally hands down, the Alpine Forget Me Not is my favorite wildflower ever, anywhere across this continent and the European continent of where I've hiked in the Alpine too. So yay. I agree, Allison. Um, most frequently in the higher altitudes, elevations, I would say, but uh, yes, but actually you do see them lower down every now and then. Hannah, can you see the chat? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, Barbara. Um, will this be somewhere where we can access it to review it? Yeah, definitely. Um, this, if you look up the San Juan Mountains Association on YouTube, um, okay. they have a YouTube channel and our forest specialist series presentations will be up there. Um, I will hopefully get this one up there by, um, by Monday at the latest. Um, I usually got to download it, save it, make a couple edits and then put it back up there. Um, so we'll have those and we'll also post them on um, the Rio Grande website, a link to it under our forest specialist page. Great. And Barbara, I'm uh, letting it come up on the computer right now. I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. I had meant to put that up, but see, I'm shirking my duties. Hannah wouldn't have done this, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at it. <laughs> All right, and you should have it now, so. Thanks. Well, I, uh, and, and we'll do this while uh, you're thinking about it, but uh, I do have a winner for the uh, um, San Juan Mountains Association water bottle. And uh, Allison Lee was the one that, the, and I see Hannah told me how to do this, Google random generator number or whatever picked it. And um, so Allison, go ahead. And one way to do this, if you'd like to just direct message me, you can with your phone number address or um, I will give you my phone number. You can call me and uh, we'll make arrangements to get you that water bottle. So you tell me what you want to do and we'll go from there.